morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here today to our fourth quarter and 2013 results media conference. This morning I have with us Harry Kirsch, CFO of Novartis, and also David Epstein, head of the pharmaceuticals group. So we'll be uh, presenting, but we also have many of the other uh, participants and members of the executive committee. Now before I get started, I would like to uh, give you my observations about the industry, specifically some of the things that I think are happening in the industry today. First, I believe that we're entering a new phase of innovation in the industry. Part of it is driven by the explosion of data, driven by deep sequencing of the human genome and our ability now to look at data in different ways and generate new targets for new medicines but also um, the fact that there are new technologies that are allowing us to go after diseases in ways that we have never before, like our CART technology with the, with the University of Pennsylvania. Now, the second point is that cost containment is here to stay. This started after the financial crisis in 2009, and we have to be able to run this business in a way that assumes we're going to have health systems around the world continue to push costs down in their countries. This means that innovation is going to become even more important in the future, and you're going to see most likely a bifurcation of companies, those that can generate innovation and are successful, or those that don't generate innovation and are continually, continually hurt by the cost containment. And then finally, there's a growing voice of using health around the world as an economic growth driver. Uh, I was in Davos last week, and when you listen to health ministers and finance ministers, a healthy population is key to driving economic growth, and economic growth is what everybody is after over the next five years. Now let me highlight our results at Novartis. We delivered sales growth in constant currencies up 4% versus a year ago to just under $58 billion. Our core EPS was up 4%. We are proposing a dividend of 2 francs 45. This is up 7% in Swiss francs, and it's up 13% in US dollars. I think the, the thing though that I'm most proud about in terms of our results is our innovation that we delivered and I'll speak more about that in a minute. We continue to progress our three strategic priorities of innovation, growth, and productivity. In terms of innovation you can see that we had 18 uh, approvals this year and in fact in the last quarter we filed AIN 457. This is secukinumab and it's a, a new uh, biologic for psoriasis. In terms of accelerating growth, all of our divisions grew in 2013. And then finally, we delivered very good productivity of $2.8 billion with over half of that coming from procurement. Going a little bit deeper in innovation, you can see that the pharma division had 13 approvals in 2013. I think one of the uh, most impressive was the Ultibo, Ultibro Breezehaler approval in Europe and Japan. This is a new drug for patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and this could become a big, important new drug for Novartis. I've talked before about the fact that our innovation is is um, recognized partly by the FDA giving us three breakthrough therapy designations. The new news here is that LDK378 for non-small cell lung cancer, we were able to submit uh, in the US in the fourth quarter of 2013. This is just nine months after we were given FDA breakthrough therapy designation, and it's just one and a half years from proof of concept of this drug in lung cancer. This is a, a tremendous um, accomplishment. Now, Alcon had a very strong year in terms of innovation also. They built what, it, what we call a refractive surgical suite, which includes an upfront diagnostic unit, takes an image of the eye, feeds that information into the LensX machine that makes the incision, and then that information is then progressed to a new phaco emulsification machine that extracts the cataract. This is all going to help surgeons deliver better outcomes for cataract patients. 
Sandoz, our generics unit, also had a very strong year in innovation. We're now running eight phase three biosimilar clinical trials across six molecules, and the latest addition is our biosimilar of Humira. Sandoz also received approval to Air Flucel, which is generic serotide in an innovative new device. So we expect that to also be a growth driver for our generics business going forward. We're proud in 2013 to have Bexero approved. This is the first vaccine for meningitis B. We've launched this vaccine now in several countries across Europe, and we expect to hear from the UK in terms of their reimbursement uh, agency, their decision on reimbursement towards the end of the first quarter this year. Now that's our first priority of innovation, and I think it was a very strong year. The second priority is to accelerate growth. And you can see from this slide that all Novartis divisions grew in 2013, from pharmaceuticals growing about 3% to consumer health growing 10%. Our track record in emerging markets also continues. So in the fourth quarter, our momentum actually increased in emerging markets. This is on a constant currency basis, up 12%. So for the whole year, emerging markets was up 10%. Now, I've had a number of questions about the currency issues in emerging markets. We have to take a long-term view. These, these uh, markets are going to continue to be uh, high-demand markets for the foreseeable future. There will be currency fluctuation. We cannot um, reduce our commitment to these markets because of currency. We're here for the long term, and we're going to continue to drive it. Pharmaceuticals had great performance in terms of new products. Both Affinitor for breast cancer and Gelenia for multiple sclerosis were up over 60% versus a year ago. So you can imagine this is how we are overcoming the more than $2 billion worth of generic erosion that we saw and still enable Novartis to show growth. Alcon was up 5%. This was driven by the surgical business, which was up 7%. And in fact, in the third and fourth quarter, we're getting additional momentum behind the surgical business. It was up 9% in both the third quarter and the fourth quarter of 2013. So we're carrying good momentum into next year, into 14. Now, Sandoz is shifting its portfolio from standard generics to differentiated generics. So we now rank number one in terms of differentiated generics such as biosimilars, such as generic injectables, dermatology, ophthalmology, and we're now moving up in respiratory as well. Our third priority is to generate productivity. And we did, a, we did what I would consider a good job in 2013. We delivered $2.8 billion. About half of that was coming from procurement. You can see $1.5 billion. That's a record for Novartis. We've organized our procurement group in a way that allows us to reduce our costs, anything that this enterprise purchases. You can see marketing and sales as a percent of sales came down across the group to now 25.1%, as well as our manufacturing footprint program. Since we announced the beginning of this program a few years ago, we've announced that we're exiting or closing 20 manufacturing sites to now shape our manufacturing footprint for the future growth development of the new products that we are going to launch. We also demonstrated good quality progress in 2013. We made a very, very strong effort across all of our manufacturing sites, and we showed uh, that we can pull a site that had an issue out of it. So our Lincoln, Nebraska site had a clean FDA audit, and it now has compliant status. There's still work to do, but that was a very important milestone. Two out of the three Sando sites that were under a warning letter also had uh, FDA audits that resulted in compliant rating from the FDA, and we're waiting for the third. The inspection's already taken place, and they will give us um, their decision shortly. So I feel like 2013, good results, and then we'll talk more about what that means for 14 in a minute, but I'd like Harry to come up now and give you a deeper dive into the numbers. Harry? Thank you very much, Joe. Good morning. So before I go into some of the details of the numbers, I just want to remind us how we are doing uh, versus the guidance we have given. 
Actually, you may recall we have increased our full year guidance two times this year based on a delay of the Diavan Mono generic event in the US, which hasn't happened yet, as well as good growth momentum. So we have guided to the group net sales to grow low to mixed single digit in constant currencies and we de delivered 4%. On core operating income, we said it will be in line or better versus 2012 and we delivered 3%. Also, the net sales guidance we gave by the divisions uh, completely achieved, especially pharma, low to single digit, low single digit with 3%. And um, this is reflected in the numbers. You see it here on the next slide. And also pretty much in line with expectations. Now on the right side, you see the constant currencies. Very positive how we operationally achieve the results. Joe mentioned some headwinds on currency. And that is not a surprise. We have shown this certainly throughout the quarters. And that's why also this morning numbers are pretty much or exactly on the consensus. And the currency effect was mainly driven by um, weakening Japanese yen um, as of quarter two, as well as the emerging market currencies have weakened mainly as of quarter three. And that's why you see on the sales a 2% negative currency impact instead of the 4% in local currencies and US dollars reported 2%. On operating income, a bigger effect. Uh, for example, co-operating income in constant currencies plus three, in US dollars, a decline of 2%. And this is due to the fact that in the yen, as well as emerging market currencies, the share of our profit is higher than the share of our sales. Now, here is the margin story by division. Overall, when you look at the lower right-hand corner, the margin of the group has declined in constant currency by 0.3 percentage points. This is entirely due to the pharmaceuticals division, where on the one hand, we had a generic impact of 2.2 billion, as well as investments in R&D, uh, to further drive our very promising pipeline and very good pipeline assets. The other divisions, Alcon, Sandos, basically flat. Alcon flat despite quite an investment into the relaunch of the uh, surgical equipment suite. And Sandos had a very high comparator year last year in the US. The Sandos division could launch the authorized generic of the Diavan HCT product as well as the Enoxaparin pricing. Consumer health, you see here um, a healthy increase as we get through the um, quality issues at Lincoln and the scale of relaunching drives up the margin as we expected. Now this chart is very important because it shows the growth momentum of our underlying business. Let me walk you through in a minute. So our volume growth is about 9% on the sales side. Now, pricing has overall on a worldwide basis 1% negative points, so underlying sales growth of 8%. This more than offset the generic impact of 4 percentage points, and I think this is an outstanding achievement. So constant currency growth in sales 4%, and then with the mentioned currency effect 2%. It's basically the same story on core operating income, but of course the generic, uh, the generic impact is somewhat higher because these products that are impacted have very high margins. And here is um, the key reason for a strong underlying growth, and David will show more later on on the growth products. But it's important that we keep rejuvenating our portfolio. And we have already 18 a billion in 2013 driven by the growth products which is more than 30% of the group sales. In pharmaceuticals, it's even 38% of their sales base, growing 25%. Now, in terms of our net debt uh, situation, we had roughly 12 billion net debt last December, December 2012. We generated 9.9 .9 billion free cash flow in the year, which we then used to pay the dividend last March of 6 billion and also did re, uh, share repurchases a net of 1.2 billion, which um, allowed us to further reduce the debt. This use of capital is exactly in line with our capital allocation strategy and priorities. 
Number one of our capital allocation priority is to make sure we invest in attractive business propositions. Number two is a strong and growing dividend. Number three is value creating bolt on acquisitions. And number four, uh, remaining cash and capital will be allocated via share buybacks to the shareholder. And that brings me to our dividend payout. Joe mentioned uh, two francs 45, a, a strong growth in 2013 of 7% in Swiss franc and 30% in dollars. Since the creation of the company in 96, uh, the 17th consecutive increase of the dividend and overall an average growth rate of 10% in Swiss francs and 13% in dollars. Our outlook for 2014 is that we grow in constant currency the sales of the group in low to mid single digits. Pharmaceuticals we expect uh, to be in line with 2013, Alcon and Sandoz in the mid to high single digits. The group core operating income in constant currencies we expect to grow ahead of sales. This is consistent with the 2014 outlook we gave early in, Janu in January 2013, adjusted for the Diavan Mono generic delay in the US. And with this, I hand over to David. Yep. Good morning, everyone. So as Harry uh, mentioned to you, we had a very good year in pharmaceuticals in 2013. In fact, growing 3% in what I would describe as a very, very challenging environment. Uh, generic inroads as well as uh, price control or price pressures in, in large parts of the world due to the economic crisis. There are two places that really distinguish Novartis from the other pharma companies and have driven our ability to grow despite losing last year over $2 billion in sales to generics first. We made a decision several years ago to increase our investment in key emerging growth markets. And as you can see from the chart, we had 9% growth in those markets and about 1% in what we would call the established markets. Uh, now representing those emerging markets now represent about 23% or so of our, of our total business. Even more importantly than that decision, which we've executed quite well, has been our decision to invest in R&D at the high end of the industry because in our hands, in the hands of our scientists, uh, we've been able to generate uh, an outstanding set of new products which are fueling growth. In fact, if you look at the revenues we've achieved from products launched since 2008, what you see is 25% uh, growth among those products and they now represent 38% of our sales. And this gives us one of the youngest uh, portfolios in the pharmaceutical industry, business that's sustainable and growable over the long term. Uh, those, those growth products make uh, an unparalleled growth platform. We have eight products and eight product families here. And as you can see, if you look at the second column from the right, you see that uh, now uh, five of these already are blockbuster franchises for us. Uh, three more are on their way. And with the exception of Lucentis, which was more or less flat on the year, uh, we had strong double-digit growth for each of the other product uh, categories. In, in particular, Gelenia up 62%. I'm going to show you why in a minute. Affinitor up 66%. Uh, but some of the products that are not spoken about so often are, are also doing quite well. For example, uh, Zolaire, which is a product for allergic asthma, grew 24%. And we have a whole new series of respiratory products uh, that are growing uh, at extraordinarily high rates and very, 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 very quickly after their initial launch. So let's talk about just a couple of those products, and then I'll give you a little bit of insight into the pipeline. Gelenia is our once a day uh, highly effective uh, oral medication for multiple sclerosis that we introduced just a, just a few years ago. And what you see is 41% growth in the US market uh, and then 94% growth uh, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world uh, growth is uh, impressive. It's also very rewarding because in a number of markets now, uh, we are now the leading MS company. Uh, so we're very encouraged. 84,000, more than 84,000 patients have been treated with Gelenius. Now we have a very good read on both the efficacy and the safety profile, and patients can take this drug uh, with confidence and know that they're going to have their disease uh, quite well uh, controlled. Turning now to our respiratory portfolio, uh, our strategy was to have a series of products for COPD against in, in different classes of medications and to put all in the same easy to use inhaler. So whether you want to, whether it's Onbrez, which is our LABA product, 
Seabri, which is our llama, or Ultibro, which is the high efficacy combination of Onbris and Seabri in one device. Uh, they're all in the same inhaler, so as a patient uh, needs to escalate to a stronger uh, product for their disease, they don't have to learn how to use that new inhaler anymore, which we believe is a real competitive advantage. Ultibro, uh, the most effective of the three products, launched just in November of last year. And what we have here on the right-hand side of the chart is the very, very early sales data. And I want to caution you that it is very early because it's only two months of data. But we compared the Ultibro launch to our other primary care launches in respiratory, but also in the fields of uh, cardiometabolic disease with Exforge and Galvis. And what you see is Ultibro is off to the fastest start uh, uh, of any of our primary care products uh, in Novartis history. So we feel good about the initial launch. We also feel good that we beat the major competitors to market uh, with this product, companies that have long established reputations and experience in the field. Uh, we will be filing Seabree uh, and Ultibro in the US in late uh, 2014, and then we have an opportunity in the US market as well, which will be defined. Galvis is our oral product for diabetes. A product that's not spoken about that much, because as you know, we did not launch in the US, so, so many uh, sort of forgot about this product. But diabetes is a, is a major uh, health problem. It's an epidemic around the world, even more so in some of the emerging markets uh, than in the Western markets, as people uh, gain weight, as they, as they go to more Western diets, and as uh, they uh, move uh, into, uh, into jobs where they, are less, they have less movement, they have less activity, less exercise. And you can see that this product uh, grew 40% during 2013. It's now a blockbuster, in part because of the new indications, but also because our commercial organization is very, very good. And you can see that despite being second or sometimes even third to market, uh, we are now the number one product in this category in more than 11 countries. So I feel very good about what the team has achieved. In our oncology business, to Cigna, our, our, once, uh, our, our uh, very effective oral therapy for, uh, for CML is doing uh, quite well. It grew 31% in the year. You can see that the Cigna is representing an ever-growing portion of our BCR able franchise as patients move from Gleevec to Tisigna because of the much better data uh, with Tisigna. Importantly, about a year ago, I told you about our strategy to show that some patients may be able to be treated with Tisigna for a number of years and then have a treatment-free remission period. The idea of potentially being, if not cured, at least being able to go, go off medication uh, for long periods of time, something that no other BCR able inhibitor can, can deliver. We fully enrolled uh, the pivotal trials uh, for, uh, to determine whether treatment-free remission is possible. And in just a few years' time, we'll be able to share the data with you. We're actually very optimistic, based upon earlier data, that in fact this drug will deliver on that promise, and then even more patients will switch from Gleevec to Cigna, given that it's such a more potent and better drug. Finitor had a very, very good year. Uh, the launch of breast cancer is on track. As you can see from the curve, we continue to uh, grow nicely. We're getting increasing use in earlier stages of breast cancer, which, which are very, very important as doctors become more comfortable with the, th with the therapy. And as we stated when we launched, we believe that there are potential sales in excess of $2 billion alone just with the breast cancer indication, not to mention the indications in, in, renal, cell, in renal cell cancer, in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and a number of other indications that are either on the market or are still in development. Last week, we issued a uh, press release, and we talked a little bit about a negative CHMP opinion for serolaxin, which is a new product that we're developing for acute heart failure. Uh, this opinion was, uh, was uh, granted uh, by or given by CHMP because they believed that with one clinical trial, the difference in improvement in the primary endpoint, which is the ability to breathe, was not meaningful enough for them, despite the fact that we had a 37% reduction in mortality, which was, which was not a primary or secondary endpoint. Given that, given that vote, the CHMP came to us and they said, we highly recommend that you ask for a re-examination. As part of that re-examination, you'll have two new rapid tours, one of which will be positive for the product, and you will likely have a new scientific advisory group. Essentially, what's happening behind the scenes is there's not been a new therapy for, for heart failure in over 20 years. So the experts are getting more and more comfortable with understanding this disease as well as our data, 
And we believe we still have a shot at getting approval during the second quarter uh, this year. It's certainly not guaranteed. And as you know, we also have another phase three trial running currently, uh, which looks at mortality, which is the main benefit of this drug, as a primary endpoint. So we'll either end up with approval in this year, or potentially we will have to wait for that second trial, which will be two to three years' time. Coincidentally, the FDA regulatory process is running totally in parallel. There's an advisory panel meeting scheduled for February the 13th, and we would expect them to take action in about the same time frame. On to better news, uh, we, made a, we made a commitment uh, to start to focus on uh, specialty dermatology also some time ago. We've had uh, two important filings, one for Zolaire, a product for chronic uh, spontaneous urticaria. This is a product that's already on the market for allergic asthma. Uh, many of you may not know what this disorder is, but it's actually fairly common. It affects up to 1% of the population. People are, will be living their normal lives, and all of a sudden, they will have rashes and hives. And some of them will have very serious angioedema. You see their lips swell, their eyes, their eyes close. Doctors will treat with high doses of antihistamines, and for about half of those patients, there is zero response to the antihistamines. This drug dramatically uh, uh, treats the disease and, pre and, and prevents occurrence of the disease. Uh, the CHMP opinion came in six months, record time, so ahead of our plan. And it, it will be very good for our business this year and for many years to come. Joe mentioned AIN, or secukinumab, which is our anti-IL-17 monoclonal antibody for the treatment of psoriasis. This drug, in, in our hands, has the best efficacy data of any of the uh, products available currently for psoriasis. We've now filed. First approvals could come near the end of 2014. Very, very excited about having two products to go to the dermatologist with. That will be a very efficient sales call for us, but also will position our company as providing very high-end, scientifically-based products for the, for the dermatologist and uh, create space to, for further innovation. Now, I didn't talk much about our oncology pipeline, so I just want to give you one slide. I believe our oncology pipeline is the best it's ever been. LDK378 for ALK positive lung cancer, the drug that Joe mentioned that got the breakthrough therapy designation, we filed at the very end of 2013 in the US. Uh, we would expect fairly rapid action by the FDA given the breakthrough nature of, of this therapy. At the very end of last year, we put out a headline press release showing that LBH589, our HDAC inhibitor, was effective in delaying progression of multiple my myeloma. This file will also go in probably at the beginning of the second quarter of, of this year. Uh, Jacovi uh, has completed accrual into its clinical trials for a new indication called polycythemia vera. And we would expect EU and Japanese submissions uh, before the end of this year. CTL-109 is the first of multiple CART therapies, taking T cells from patients, modifying them, giving them back, and changing the course of the disease. Patients with ALL and CLL have had their lives rescued and saved. This will be a whole new area of medicine. There are very few companies in this space, and Novartis is a leader. And last but not least, we have a drug called LEE. This is a selective CDK4-6 inhibitor. Not much different from the Pfizer drug in this category where, where we're competing. The possibility of radically changing the way breast cancer is treated and becoming maybe one of, one of the biggest products in our portfolio hood, actually, if it works the way we expect it to. And there's a lot more as, on the bottom of the page, which I won't go into today. I believe that this new oncology portfolio is, is underestimated about the difference we will make in patients' lives. So based upon this portfolio, we're going to have another busy year. Our, our, our development colleagues, uh, the people in regulatory affairs, uh, they don't get much free time at Novartis. They're working, they're working literally around the clock. And you can see the, uh, the expected news flow for this year. Uh, and there, of course, this is, this, these, are, these are the highlights. There'll be a lot, a lot more. And I won't read the chart for you, but certainly later we can talk about during Q&A uh, some of these if, if you're interested. So with that, Joe, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Thanks, David. OK, so just to close, uh, we're going to continue our three strategic priorities of innovation, growth, and productivity. We look forward to um, submitting the respiratory franchise, the two drugs, Ultibro and Breezehaler, in the US, as well as get approval to our new lung cancer drug, LDK, in the US. But this will be an important year for Novartis in terms of innovation. I also want to say, though, that we are enhancing this year the how. 
how we deliver our strategy, and we're calling this high performance with integrity, and it, it includes a focus on compliant behavior around the world for all of our, um, all of our associates, as well as e elevating quality and ensuring that we're maintaining on uh, the quality path that we're currently on. Now, there's just three other points that I want to make as we execute our plan. The first, you've heard me talk about the management of our portfolio. We started this review back in the spring of 2013. I wanted to get this completed by 2014. And the first uh, action that we took was the divestiture of our blood transfusion diagnostics unit to Griffles. We, we closed that deal in early January, and that was 1.7 uh, billion US dollars to Novartis for that business. Secondly, though, we're going to take an increasing look at synergies across divisions. That is, how can we leverage the strength of our portfolio, which is diversified, both on the revenue side and also on the cost side? And then finally, continued focus on delivering superior shareholder returns. So we announced in November a share buyback of five billion US dollars over two years. If you look at the dividend that we're proposing this year, would be over six billion. Assuming another dividend like that in 17 or in uh, 15, you could see that over the two-year period, 2014 and 15, Novartis returning over 18 billion dollars to shareholders. 